You're the big, you're like one of the big, one of those big uh, new media disruptors. Why did the entertainment industry need to be disrupted? Oh, I think just for the fun of it. <laughs> uh... Stephen Colbert was correct. This man right here, Reed Hastings, has disrupted traditional media companies. He's heavily disrupted them to the point where now they're racing to catch up with his company. At the time of this interview in 2015, Netflix only had 60 million subscribers. Today they boast over 200 million subscribers and they still have a record low churn rate. They are keeping people subscribed to their service while increasing that amount of subscribers dramatically. This is what I define as the holy grail of business models. This is the business model of the 21st century. Subscribership businesses. And Netflix knows this best. Reed Hastings is one of the first ones to really embrace this style of business model, and it's paid off handsomely. What analysts and other investors have had a difficult time seeing is the slow compounding effect of subscribership businesses. This constant and growing reoccurring income provides these companies with the opportunity to continually reinvest back in their business with a steady stream of capital. Netflix has been able to do this and build out a robust library of content over the past 15 years. If we look at this chart here, this is their subscribership growth over time. Look how steady this is. It doesn't matter what's going on with the economy. It doesn't matter how much money households have. It doesn't matter if there's a Democrat president or a Republican president. It doesn't matter if there's other streaming companies or other competitors entering in. Netflix continues to grow its subscribership business and therefore it grows its revenue, it grows its content library, and it grows its lead over other companies. This has been the story of Netflix for the past decade and further. Now, other companies have become envious over time of Netflix's business model, of their nice, consistent, reliable income with a subscription business with a low churn rate. And they want to do the same thing. I see this happening with every single industry. This is part of the reason why I've invested into the gaming industry. I recently invested $23,000 into an ETF that gives me broad exposure to the video game industry. Now, part of the reason why is because video games are growing fast. This is a really fast growing industry. But another big reason why is because the economics of the video game industry is changing to a more subscription-based industry. Now these gaming companies don't rely on just one big hit game per year. Now they have residual income through season passes and subscriptions on their platforms. Another company that's benefited heavily from their recent shift into subscription services is Apple. This is a company that I invested $16,000 in and it's turned into $23,500 as of today. And I think that the reason that Apple doubled in value over the past year is because of their ongoing transition into subscription-based businesses. They now offer Apple TV and Apple Music and Apple Arcade and iCloud and Apple News and Apple Fitness. All of these purchased on a monthly subscription basis. Another example is Disney. This is a company that has their parks mostly shut down. They have their cruise lines closed. They have movie theaters theaters shut down, and they're not able to release their big box office films in the movie theaters, and yet the stock price has soared to an all-time high, defying all the metrics of the company for one simple reason, their transition to a subscription-based business through Disney+. Plus. That is what has caused this stock to soar to almost $200 a share. I think after looking at example after example, the evidence is very clear. Subscription business models is the holy grail of business models, and companies that can successfully build that or transition to it are the winners of the 21st century. Those are the companies that will be ultimately the most successful. So the question is for us investors, how do we identify the companies that are going to be the best at building subscription-based businesses? That's what we're going to be going over in this episode. Now, the first good example we can look at of building a subscription-based business is obviously Netflix. They've been successful at doing this up to 200 million subscribers, and it's still growing quarter over quarter. They continue to grow their subscriber base despite lots of analysts and other investors doubting their future growth potential. And Netflix is a ability to continue growing their subscriber base has been reflected in their stock price. It's now trading at an all-time high around $550 a share. But like I mentioned earlier, with Netflix being the shining beacon of the best type of business model, it's made other companies envious. And legacy companies are starting to move into Netflix's territory. And news from our parent company tonight unveiling Disney+. Plus. Disney launching its new streaming service in November. It will feature its top movies, new shows from the Marvel and Star Wars franchises and classic Disney films. Disney CEO Bob Iger calling it a game changer. It's massive because in one place, people will be able to see that great library of product dating all the way back to Snow White 1937 and Mickey shorts from the 20s. The fact that people have a chance to see more of Star Wars, more of uh, Marvel, more of Disney, 
you know, that's, that's a big deal. In 2019, Disney would soon become Netflix's biggest competitor. They launched the service Disney Plus, which had their entire library plus a few originals on it for a very cheap price per month. And Netflix knows that this was going to happen. They knew that eventually the legacy companies would catch on and start investing into their own streaming services. That's why Netflix built out their own original library. But I don't think that Reed Hastings fully understood how good of a competitor Disney would become. I remember reading this headline and being stunned by it. Disney Plus surpasses 10 million subscribers on its first day. On the very first day, they had over 10 million subscribers. And keep in mind, this was in 2019. This is before the pandemic. People were not subscribing just because they were stuck at home. This is the amount of demand that Disney had just on the initial launch of their streaming service. And their subscribership growth really didn't slow down that much. In May of 2020, Disney announced that they had 54.5 million subscribers. This was just in a few months, they grew to 54.5 million subscribers. This is when I started to invest heavily in Disney. If they're gaining subscribers this rapidly, they're probably going to do well in the future. Now, Reed Hastings is incredibly smart. He knew that Disney would pose a challenge in the future. In an interview in 2019 with the New York Times, he's asked specifically about the competitive landscape. What type of companies does he think will be the biggest competitors? He's asked about big tech companies like Amazon with Amazon Prime Video and Apple with Apple TV+. Plus, and this is his response. You know, Disney's been, I mean, th those are great guys, but, you know, Disney's an amazing amazing company and I think they're going to have great success. Is that the one you worry we. about today? I'm not saying we worry about it. We admire them. I mean, you know, I'll subscribe. They've got great shows. It's, you know, uh, they're a wonderful competitor because they really understand creativity. We learn, we observe, we watch them. Uh, we admire the heck out of them. What about Apple? You know, uh, there's a bunch of tech companies um, that are in entertainment, but I think, uh, you know, Disney's the one that we really have the most to learn from in terms of entertainment. He's not too worried about the big tech companies. His biggest concern is Disney. Reed Hastings saying that Disney's the one that they have the most to learn from, I think is a very respectful way of saying that Disney's probably going to become one of their biggest competitors. Now, fast forward to September of 2020. Reed Hastings is asked again about Disney+. Plus. At the time, they had 60 million subscribers, and he was asked how many he thought they would have at this point in time. Oh, maybe 20 million at best. Um, you know, they've uh, most companies have a hard time executing on something as radical as, you know, let's go direct to consumer over the Internet. Um, and they've done a remarkable job growing to over 60 million in less than 12 months, you know, and it took us like 12 or 13 years to get there. Um, so uh, they're, you know, very focused, obviously, on uh, direct to consumer. Um, but so are we. Disney had obviously surpassed his expectations, growing to 60 million subscribers so quickly. But Reed Hastings isn't sitting on his hands. He makes some very audacious statements in this interview. We want to get better than Disney in family entertainment. And that's going to take five or 10 years. You know, they are very, very good at it. Uh, but, you know, we're very focused and we continue to learn new things. He just said that he wants Netflix to get better than Disney at family entertainment. That's really a goal they have. But Netflix seems to be taking this goal very seriously. They've rolled out a lot of kids programming and they even have an entire app dedicated to allowing parents to see what kids are viewing and suggesting content based on their interests and things that they should be learning. But the battle for subscribers has continued on. Netflix gained over 37 million subscribers in 2020, reaching over 200 million total. And then the most recent report from Disney is that they reached 94.9 million subscribers for Disney Plus in 14 months. Almost 100 million in 14 months. That was their original four-year goal. Now, Disney has recently revised their goals regarding streaming. They've moved the goalposts a lot closer. They now say that they expect to have up to 260 million subscribers for Disney Plus just by 2024. So in just a couple years, they expect to have 260 million subscribers. This has caused a lot of people to ultimately question what company is going to come out on top? Which one will eventually be the biggest streaming company in the world with the most subscribers? There's large hedge funds like Third Point that have invested significant amounts of capital into Disney, believing that they will ultimately become the biggest media company with the most subscribers. In this letter, they note the opportunity for Disney. They say, with Disney's superior tentpole franchises and production capabilities, we believe that the company can exceed the subscriber base of the industry leader 
Netflix in just a few years. But time is of the essence, and the company should consider significant additional investments in content, both through production and acquisition here and abroad. They say that Disney should lean into their subscription business, that they should put all their effort into it because that is the superior business model. And they viewed how it's worked out for other companies that have done the same. Adobe and Microsoft stand out as particularly relevant examples of companies which in order to optimize their distribution models had to forego lucrative upfront license revenues in exchange for monthly subscriptions. That is exactly what Disney is in the transition of doing right now. They're foregoing the theatrical release in the movie theater and instead focusing on the subscription business. They continue saying investors have learned that while these strategic shifts made depressed near-term earnings, their patients will be rewarded with a business that's many multiples the size of what they once were. Furthermore, the stocks like Microsoft and Adobe, which are subscription businesses, are rewarded with significantly higher multiples reflecting the superiority of their new reoccurring subscription revenue streams, a significant improvement over their historic lumpy transactional model. Both companies' shares have appreciated significantly since these transitions begin. This hedge fund ran by Dan Loeb realizes that subscriptions are the holy grail of business models, and that's why they're urging Disney to go into it so strongly. They believe that there's a massive opportunity for Disney to overtake Netflix and grow their company substantially. Now, Dan Loeb obviously believes that Disney will become the ultimate winner of the streaming wars. That's why he's so heavily invested in the company. But there's people on the other side of this argument that believe that Netflix will become the ultimate winner. One of those people is the media mogul, Tom Rogers. I will start you off with the same question I asked Guy, and that is, what is the message to the competitors of Netflix from this quarter? Well, as a longtime uh, media veteran, what this earnings report says to me is that Netflix will be the most valuable media company in the world. Uh, so in that sense, I think I got it absolutely right. After seeing Netflix reach 200 plus million subscribers, he believes firmly that Netflix will become the biggest media company in the world. And he goes on to outline his argument for why this is going to happen. With success, there is no cost to Netflix. With streaming success for the legacy media companies, there is huge cost, and that cost is pretty much being ignored. What we've known already is that the cord cutting disruption is obviously wreaking havoc on the models for the network business. What we saw this quarter is that HBO decided it could not compete in streaming without putting all of its movie slate on HBO Max. I think Disney is likely to follow that. They're toying with it a little bit. They talked about all kinds of flexibility. His first argument of why Netflix will be more successful than Disney or HBO is because both Disney and HBO are sacrificing older businesses and previous revenue that they had to build up this new business. Netflix is not in the same situation. They're not sacrificing anything when they gain on new customers. But when you start thinking about the cost to the legacy business, the unraveling of the cable satellite bundle, not being able to look at the theatrical window is driving uh, the huge kind of values it has there for Disney in particular and other companies. What it means in terms of having to forego all the licensing costs to external parties in international licensing as they use that content on their own platforms, that cost is meaningful and it's not being factored in. So his first major reason of believing in Netflix's ultimate success is because Disney and HBO have to cannibalize other forms of revenue to be able to grow their streaming service. Netflix doesn't have to do that. The next point he brings up in Netflix's benefit is pricing power. Now the sub numbers people look at are the headline things and they're meaningful, but they're not as meaningful as pricing power. As was mentioned, Netflix is raising price and do consistently doing so across the globe it's not as important as engagement. Netflix has five times the engagement in terms of hours spent that Disney Plus does. It has five times what HBO and Showtime combined have. And that brings with it further pricing power. Now, Netflix does have substantially more engagement on its service by its users than any other competitor. None of them really come close. And unless Disney can increase the amount of engagement on its service, it's not going to have the same level of pricing power that Netflix currently enjoys. He goes on to describe that he doesn't see much of a bear case left for Netflix, that the critics of the company have continually been wrong, and he thinks they'll be wrong in the future. And when you put that together, you got to ask, what's the bet left of the bear thesis? Originally, it was, oh, they're going to lose friends. Their whole programming strategy is going to go away. 
That turned out to be nonsense. Then it was, these guys will never hit cash flow break even. Well, they've shown their cash flow positive this year, and they're going forward, they're going to be cash flow positive. Then it's competition is really going to limit them. Well, we've seen with the competition, they're still the number one. It's, as Guy said, who's going to else are you going to have? Netflix has the pole position. They will be in almost all streaming homes. So both these businesses are racing for subscribers. There's people like Dan Loeb that believes that Disney will be the ultimate winner. There's people like Tom Rogers that believes that Netflix will be the ultimate winner. And then I asked the audience here, with 2,000 votes, who's going to have the most subscribers by 2024, Disney Plus or Netflix? 64% of you said that Netflix will, 36% said Disney Plus. In my opinion, I'm very bullish on both of these companies. I think that Netflix will be very successful. I hold it in my growth portfolio. And I also have $22,000 invested into Disney. Disney because I think their streaming service is going to be incredibly successful. And I hold it in the passive income account because I think eventually when they get their parks fully operational, they'll return paying a dividend to their shareholders. Both of these companies offer a unique opportunity to buy into a business that has a massive and growing subscriber business, which is obviously, in my opinion, the best type of business to own. So while not every company in my portfolio is a subscribership based business, I do give them preferential treatment. If I see an industry like the video game industry is moving more to a subscription-based model, I'll be more inclined to invest in that industry. And if I see companies like Apple or Disney that have invested heavily in subscription-based services, I'll be more inclined to invest in those companies because of how superior I believe that business model is. Now, if you want to view any of the companies I have in this portfolio, I'll leave a link in the description as well as my growth center portfolio. You can take a look at that as well. You can also check out my secondary channel. It's called Joseph Carlson After Hours. It's where I do in-person videos. And also, if you're interested, you can check out the Patreon. This not only allows me to build up my own little mini version of a subscription business model where I'm not so reliant on YouTube ad revenue, but it also allows you to access a lot of exclusive content. So you can check that out if you're interested. Other than that, make sure you're subscribed and I'll talk to you soon.